Hello, everybody. Hello. And welcome to the Dock Street Theatre on the 10th and final day of Charleston Literary Festival 2022. Yes. <laughs> First, I'd like to remind you all to please turn off your mobile phones. Thank you. And next, I'd like to say that this year's festival has been an absolute delight, and in our eyes, at least, a massive, massive success. Uh, and it's only possible thanks to the support of our sponsors, who believe in our mission to create a forum for books, the free exchange of ideas and conversations. And so with that in mind, I'd like to give a huge thank you to all of our donors, and especially the sponsors of this event, Martha and Orton Jackson. Thank you very much. So to the event at hand, today's session sees actor and narrator Eduardo Ballerini reading two poems by T.S. Eliot, The Love Song of J. Alfred Brufrock and The Wasteland. If you were already at Lyndall Gordon's talk this morning on Eliot, that was a fabulous setting of the scene to get us in the mood. If you weren't, you have to make two with me. Um, by way of introduction, I want to say three things about The Wasteland. The first one is that The Wasteland is 100 years old this year. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock was published in 1915, and The Wasteland was first published in October 1922. And this was a big year for literature and literary experimentation. Such a big year that our friend and interlocutor Bill Goldstein wrote a whole book about it. It was the year that Ulysses by James Joyce was published. It was the year that Virginia Woolf's Jacob's Room was published. And again, it was the year that Eliot published The Wasteland. So it's easy for me to stand up here and say, this poem is as relevant today as it was 100 years ago. So I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to ask you, as you listen to The Wasteland, to watch out for ideas, themes, scenes, and thoughts that feel relevant to you right now. The second thing I want to say is that this poem has been called one of the most influential poems ever written. This poem is extraordinary as it redraws the boundaries of, of what people expect from poetry. A hundred years ago, and today, that raises a few eyebrows. When it was first published, one critic accused Eliot of willful obscurantism, which is an obscure way of saying that Eliot is too obscure. <laughs> Another critic, seeing The Wasteland published as a poem with corresponding explanatory notes, said that publishing a poem with notes was the equivalent of having a painting and writing underneath this is a dog. <laughs> Eliot, though, was less interested in what poetry says and more interested in what poetry does. And the wasteland moves away from cut and dry meaning into a fluid, free-flowing experience. It's been compared to a mosaic. Its many voices make it feel like you're switching channels on a TV, jumping from scene to scene. The Irish poet James Heaney said, the more I read Eliot, the more I attend to the musical underwriting of the poem. The last thing I want to tell you is what Virginia Woolf wrote about the wasteland. She said this, Eliot dined last Sunday and read his poem. He sang it and chanted it and rhythmed it. It has great beauty and force of phrase, symmetry and tensity. What connects it together, I'm not so sure. One was left, however, with some strong emotion. So today, as you listen to the wasteland, I appeal to all of you to pay attention to the strong emotion. To the reading itself, we are absolutely delighted and honored to have Eduardo Ballerini here. Eduardo Ballerini is an actor, a narrator, a writer, and director. On screen, he has appeared in over 50 films and TV series, including recurring roles on The Sopranos, Boardwalk Empire, and 24. He recently completed filming on the upcoming Hulu series, Retreat, opposite Emma Corrin and Clive Owen. As a narrator, the New York Times calls him a master in his field at the forefront of a new kind of celebrity. He is the two-time winner of the industry's highest prize, the Audiobook Publishers Association's Best Male Narrator Award. In 2019, he was named Golden Voice by Audiophile Magazine, and he has recorded over 400 titles, ranging from an unabridged recording of the Hebrew Bible to modern-day bestsellers. In 2021, he co-created the Audible original, The Angel of Rome, with Jess Walter. And this year, in 2022, he was commissioned by the estate of T.S. Eliot, along with Faber and Faber, to record the centenary edition of The Wasteland. So that means that the estate of T.S. Eliot 
think he's the best person in the world to read Eliot's poetry, and he's here today to read just for us. So, reading the love song of J. Alfred Brufrock and The Wasteland, please join me in welcoming Eduardo Ballerini. Thank you. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes, there will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the buttons of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress? that makes me so digress. Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, where it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all 
After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile? After the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the print. No doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. Thank you. Thank you. The Wasteland. One, the burial of the dead. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over the Stanbergesee with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Russen, stamm aus Litau, nicht Deutsch. And when we were children staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Frisch wenn der Wind, der Heimat so, mein irisch Kind, wo weilisch du? You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. Yet when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak, and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light, the silence. Und um lire das mir. Madame Sosostris, famous clairvoyante, had a bad cold. Nevertheless, is known to be the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards. Here said she, is your card, the drowned Phoenician sailor. 
Those are pearls that were his eyes. Look. Here is Belladonna, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is the man with three staves, and here the wheel. And here is the one-eyed merchant. And this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man. Fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. Thank you. If you see, dear Mrs. Equitone, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. Unreal city. Under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet flowed up the hill and down King William Street to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. There I saw one I knew and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Miley, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. You, hypocrite lecteur, Mon semblable, mon frère. Two, a game of chess. The chair she sat in, like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble where the glass held up by standards wrought with fruited vines from which a golden cupidon peeped out. Another hid his eyes behind his wing, doubled the flames of seven-branched candelabra, reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it, from satin cases poured in rich profusion. In vials of ivory and colored glass unstoppered lurked her strange synthetic perfumes, unguent, powder, or liquid, troubled, confused, and drowned the sense in odors. Stirred by the air that freshened from the window, these ascended in fattening the prolonged candle flames, flung their smoke into the lacquer area, stirring the pattern on the coffered ceiling. Huge sea wood fed with copper, burned green and orange, framed by the colored stone in which sad light a carved dolphin swam. Above the antique mantel was displayed as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene the change of Philomel by the barbarous king so rudely forced. Yet there the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice, and still she cried, and still the world pursues Jug, jug, to dirty ears. And other withered stumps of time were told upon the walls. Staring forms leaned out, leaning, hushing the room enclosed. Footsteps shuffled on the stair. Under the firelight, under the brush, her hair spread out in fiery points, glowed into words, then would be savagely still. My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you're thinking. Think. I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing. Again, nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? But oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag. It's so elegant, so intelligent. What shall I do now? What shall I do? I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down so. What shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at 10. And if it rains, a closed car at 4. And we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to her myself, hurry up, please, it's time. Now Albert's coming back, make yourself a bit smart. He'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did, I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. And if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and give me a straight look. 
Hurry up, please, it's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't, but if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique. And her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already and nearly died of young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please, it's time. Well, that Sunday, Albert was home. They had a hot gammon, and they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it hot. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Ta-ta. Good night. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Three, the fire sermon. The river's tent is broken. The last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed. And their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors, departed, have left no addresses. By the waters of Lehman, I sat down and wept. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Sweet Thames, run softly, for I speak not loud or long. But at my back, in a cold blast, I hear the rattle of the bones and chuckles spread from ear to ear. A rat crept softly through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank while I was fishing in the dull canal on a winter evening round behind the gas house, musing upon the king my brother's wreck and on the king my father's death before him. White bodies naked on the low damp ground and bones cast in a little low dry garret, rattled by the rat's foot only year to year. But at my back, from time to time, I hear the sound of horns and motors, which shall bring Sweeney to Mrs. Porter in the spring. Oh, the moon shone bright on Mrs. Porter and on her daughter. They washed their feet in soda water. Et oh, ces voix d'enfants chantant de la coupole. Twit, twit, twit. Jug, 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 jug. So rudely forced. Terreux. Unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter noon, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven with a pocket full of currents, CIF London, documents at sight, asked me in demotic French to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing waiting, I, Tiresias, Though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea, the typist home at tea time, clears her breakfast, lights her stove, and lays out food in tins. Out of the window perilously spread her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays. On the divan are piled at night her bed, stockings, Slippers, camisoles, and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I, too, awaited the expected guest. He, the young man, carbuncular, arrives. A small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious, as he guesses. The meal is ended. She is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all enacted on this same divan or bed. 
I who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead, bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again, alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. This music crept by me upon the waters and along the strand up Queen Victoria Street. Oh, city, city. I can sometimes hear beside a public bar in Lower Thames Street the pleasant whining of a mandolin and a clatter and a chatter from within where fishmen lounge at noon, where the walls of Magnus Martyr hold inexplicable splendor of Ionian white and gold. The river sweats, oil and tar. The barges drift with the turning tide. Red sails wide to leeward swing on the heavy spar. The barges wash drifting logs down Greenwich Reach, past the Isle of Dogs. Wa-la-la-lea, wa la 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 lea la la Elizabeth and Lester beating oars. The stern was formed, a gilded shell, red and gold. The brisk swell rippled both shores. Southwest wind carried downstream the peal of bells, white towers. wa la la lea wa la 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 lea la la Trams and dusty trees. Highbury bore me. Richmond and Kew undid me. By Richmond, I raised my knees supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are at Moorgate, and my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails of dirty hands. My people, humble people, who expect nothing. La, la. To Carthage then I came, burning, 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 burning. O oh Lord, thou pluckest me out. O oh Lord, thou pluckest. Burning. For death by water. Phlebas the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, O oh you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. Five. What the thunder said. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains, he who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Here is no water but only rock. Rock and no water and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock, one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. If there were only water amongst the rock, dead mountain mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit, here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-racked houses. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, if there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 drop. But there is no water. Who is the third who always walks beside you? 
When I count, there are only you and I together, but when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? What is that sound high in the air, murmur of maternal lamentation? Who are those hooded hordes swarming over endless plains, stumbling in cracked earth, ringed by the flat horizon only? What is the city over the mountains, cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air, falling towers, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London, unreal. A woman drew her long black hair out tight and fiddled whisper music on those strings and bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward down a blackened wall and upside down in air were towers, tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours, and voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. In this decayed hole among the mountains in the faint moonlight, the grass is singing over the tumbled graves. About the chapel, there is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. It has no windows, and the door swings. Dry bones can harm no one. Only a cock stood on the rooftop. Cocorico, cocorico. In a flash of lightning, then a damp gust bringing rain. Ganga was sunken, and the limp leaves waited for rain, while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. The jungle crouched, humped in silence. Then spoke the thunder. Da. Data. What have we given? My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries, or in memories draped by the beneficent spider, or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Da, diadvam. I've heard the key turn in the door once, and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison thinking of the key. Each confirms a prison only at nightfall. Ethereal rumors revive for a moment a broken Coriolanus. Da. Damyata. The boat responded gaily to the expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. I sat upon the shore, fishing for the arid plain behind me. Shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Poi s'ascosse nel fuoco che gli affina quando fiam uti chelidon o swallo swallo le ponce d'Aquitaine alla tour aboli. These fragments I have shored against my ruins. Why then I'll fit you. Hieronymo's mad again. Data. Diadvan. Damyata. Shanti. Shanti, Shanti. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, I've never been able to read Eliot in such a beautiful space. <laughs> It's quite extraordinary, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for that beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, Eduardo, as I introduced, he's told me that he's been to a lot of film festivals <laughs> in his life, but this is his first literary festival, so we're very, very welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're very, very happy to have you. Um, so I'd like to just start by asking you about your own personal relationship to Eliot. I have a, a funny, well, I hope it's a funny Eliot story. Um, <laughs> When I was in college, uh, I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut, 
And uh, one day I, I just needed to get off campus. It's one of those days when you just wanted to get away. And I, I went down into Middletown and I found myself in front of the Middletown Public Library. And uh, I'm the child of two academics. My father's a poet, my mother's an art historian, so I've, I always take great comfort in libraries and museums. So I went in and I was looking around and I found myself in front of a bin of records, the old vinyl LPs. And I was just sort of absent-mindedly thumbing through it, and there was T.S. Eliot, reads The Wasteland, Prufrock, Hollow Men, whatever it was. And I, I did not know much about T.S. Eliot, to be honest, but there was something about his face which I just found so extraordinary. People who know what he looks like will, can appreciate this. He's got this sort of haunted and haunting kind of old man look, and he looked like he was stuffed into this suit, and he was hunched over, and he looked sort of wise and creepy all at once. And for <laughs> some reason, I, I said, I, I, I'm going to check this out of the library. So I got myself a library card, and I checked the album out of the library, which was a strange thing to do because I did not have a record player. <laughs> so the album sat on my desk for about a week, and it was like those paintings where the eyes sort of follow you around the room. So he was staring at me for the longest time. I finally got around to borrowing a turntable, and I, one night by myself, uh, listened to it. And it, it was one of those moments in a lifetime where I knew I would never be the same after hearing this. I don't know why, I don't know how. There was something in his voice and the words. I understood none of it at the time, but something happened. It was. It's almost like if it's like a scene in a movie, like the lightning bolts would have gone off and you know, the camera would have pushed in tight on the awestruck face. And that was the moment I had. And so I, I, I taped it, I put it onto a cassette and I would walk around the Wesleyan campus listening to T.S. Eliot. I had no interest in spoken word, uh, but I just memorized his poems. And, and then Eliot and I, uh, after college, I became an actor and there's not a lot of calling for poetry in acting. Um, and we sort of parted ways, as it were. But he was always there in the background. And then an extraordinary thing happened, which was, I think you mentioned it, that Faber got in touch with me. But it was when it happened. It was, um, sorry, it's a, just going to take a breath. It was at the beginning of the pandemic. And we were all terrified. And I got this email saying, would you like to record T.S. Eliot? And Eliot came back into my life at another moment when I knew once again that nothing would ever be the same. And it sort of bookended this quarter of a century of my life. And it's just been an extraordinary thing. And again, I say to you, thank you for having me here because to read in this magnificent venue with you is just such a privilege, so thank you. And so when you were invited by Faber to come uh, and read The Wasteland, mm -hmm. what was that process like? How much direction did they give you? And did that, that process change your relationship with the poem or uncover something in the poem you didn't see before? <coughs> I think about musicians who do covers of songs. <laughs> no, I'm serious, because I often wonder how they can not hear the original. And so as somebody who essentially spent two and a half years, three years, listening to T.S. Eliot read these poems, he was clearly in my head. Uh, but I, obviously, I didn't want to just imitate him. Yeah. Um, but it took me all the way back into that dorm room uh, when I first listened to him. And I had to, what I did to kind of purge Eliot's uh, voice from my head was I listened to all the different recordings that are out there, and there are many wonderful ones. Um, and so I tried to sort of listen to as many people doing it as possible so I could just come at it as, as fresh as possible. Mm. Um, and I wanted to try to modernize it a bit. Yeah. Um, one of the things that always strikes me about The Wasteland is how rhythmic it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm always amazed at how much rhyming there is in it. We think of this, you know, poem that shattered all the norms and all the forms, but it's still, and I just rhymed myself, um, <laughs> has all these rhymes, you know, internal, and it has a meter and all of that. Um, 
So, but I wanted to, to try to modernize it as much as possible. Yeah. It's funny, Lyndall Gordon was talking about Elliot, Elliot specifically talking about the rhythm yeah. of the waistline and how oh, important yeah. it is. I did, I did one strange, another strange thing in college. Um, I had a drummer friend of mine uh, try to, to drum along to me reading uh, Proof Rock because I was convinced that, and God, I wish I had a tape of that. Um, <laughs> I was convinced that you could drum in, in time to Proof Rock all the way through, so we sat in there and he, he hammered away and I read the poem. And, um, and it seemed to work. Actually. <laughs> yeah. And then in terms of like where you place the emphasis, these decisions that you have to make, yeah. are they very much, especially for the favorite uh, version, yeah. were they very much your decisions? Yeah, there, uh, your question about was there a director, there was not. I was, okay. I was on my own doing it. And what strikes me often about Eliot is that when you read him, you can actually put the emphasis somewhere else depending mm -hmm. on how it's sort of happening. Because you're imbuing meaning right. when you read. Yeah. Um, there are some obvious inflection points, uh, but then sometimes you think, oh, you know, if I just stress this, this kind of turns into this. Yeah. So for a live reading, I, I try to just, again, sort of empty my head and let it kind of go through me. Mm -hmm. uh, when it came to the recordings, I, I, again, it was a similar approach. I tried to do them... Uh, quickly in the sense that I didn't want to think too hard about it. These were poems I'd, I'd known for so long and they were in me. I wanted to just get into my studio, kind of do them, send them off, and if they had notes, they would send them to me. Yeah. And what did your father, who's a poet, think about your obsession with Eliot? <laughs> my father is, a, is an Italian poet. His name is Luigi Ballerini. The, the name won't mean anything to you here, but he's fairly well known in Italy. Uh, and so, to some extent, I've lived under the shadow of a famous poet. Um, and so, of course, then I chose an obscure poet like T.S. Eliot to, <laughs> to continue this journey. Um, when I, uh, just, since it's just us here, um, when I told my parents I wanted to be an actor, I think their jaws hit the floor and said, why in God's name would you want to do that? Um, and so having come sort of full circle to literature and this marriage of literature and acting, which the narration and audiobook world very much is, yeah. I think uh, probably finally, I probably finally made my parents happy. <laughs> it's been a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. um, no, he was extraordinarily uh, proud of this. The one mm. thing he was not happy about, though, is that he is doing a festival this weekend in New York, and he wanted me to read there. Uh, oh! <laughs> Uh, Scusa, Luigi. Yeah, Scusa. <laughs> uh, and I said, but I get the, the Elliot in the Doc Theater. I, when did, you know, I got a hundred year anniversary. I got to do it, you know. So, so probably right about now, he's reading up there things that I should be reading. Well, then, extra special thanks for coming. <laughs> um, I'm going to open the floor to questions from the audience, but quickly, I want to ask you one more thing, which yeah. is um, obviously you are an actor and yeah. a performer, and yeah. you just mentioned there this idea of like, but you're also, you also read, you're an audiobook narrator. When it comes to a performance like this, um, where do you see the line of the difference between a performance versus a reading? How do you think about those things? You know, with poetry, I think there's a lot of room for interpretation. Uh, I think of poems the way I think of plays. Yeah. Like you can stage Shakespeare however you want. You can uh, uh, read, you know, poems however you want. I think with, <sighs> it's a trick, it's a very long, uh, Answer, but with audiobooks, uh, I try to stick with what I consider to be the author's intent as much as possible. I do not mm. want to impose myself onto their work. It's a very fine line narration. You, you want people to recognize and appreciate your performance and at the same time get the hell out of the way yeah. uh, because you really just want to serve the text. Um, with poetry, I think there's a little more room for a kind of performative approach mm. to it. Um, especially when we're talking about you know, something that's 100 years old and has been read many, many times. Um, but that's the, the sort of short answer to that. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Thinking, hands up. Um, I've heard the Wasteland uh, compared to a radio play before there were radio plays, and you can hear that in all the different voices right. sort of jumping around. Right. Um, while people are thinking of their questions, I'll ask you another one. Um, and you sort of bring that to life in your performance. Yeah. What are sort of the challenges of sort of finding those right nuances and jumping and... I, I've always considered The Wasteland to be a series of scenes. Yeah. Um, and I've described it as if, you know, sorry to use a film analogy again, but 
is if you're sort of sticking a camera into one room and then you're going down the street and you're sticking a camera into another room and then you're walking along and you're going down the alley and then you're seeing another room. And so they're, they're each distinct scenes in my mind which, you know, they call for a, a kind of different, a different voice and a different approach in each section. Um, you know, you could, I, I, somebody could probably stage, you know, they could probably build a play around, uh, maybe it's been done, pardon my mm. ignorance if I've just said something woefully stupid. Um, you could really build a stage play around it and all these characters. And he has this incredible balance of, you know, there's this, the, the, the language is so beautiful, and, you know, these images are incredible, but it's painting a rather bleak yeah. picture of things, you know, I mean, there's a sexual assault happening in one scene, you know, there's like, you know, and, and yet it's so beautifully told, you know, um, and so there's that, which is very much Eliot, I think, you know, yeah. he had a very dark side from what I can understand of him. Um, but also this, you know, lyrical and beautiful side as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, and when I was talking at the beginning and talking about like what's relevant for our day, there's, yeah. al there's also an abortion in the wasteland. Yeah. FYI. Um, any questions from the audience? Sure. We can wait for the microphone. Lee is going to bring it down this side, or it will come flying down the side of the corridor now before you see it. Gotta have a microphone. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for standing as well. Um, I just wanted to compliment you. Wonderful, wonderful reading. Thank you. Um, you know, I've known Proof Rock since I was 18 when I was a freshman in college. Um, it just struck me that, as you know, Proof Rock opens with a quote from oh, Dante's Dante. Inferno. I did not read that, but and, yeah. and, you know, I was just thinking, with your Italian yeah. background and your wonderful accents, yeah. it would have just been marvelous. I, I, I debated this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I've, I've done that before, and I always feel like the, the uh, listening audience is saying, is he reading the right poem? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I just, I've, I've opted to skip it. Um, also, hearing you talk about walking around, listening furtively to Elliot at yeah. university kind of reminded me of Lyndall Gordon talking about Elliot walking around with Dante in his pocket, right. reciting it to people, so there's also right. a line there. Yeah. So next time with the Italian. There's another question here. Uh, um, he right here in the front and then in the back. Thank you. Go ahead. You go first. Uh, yeah. In, in a few words, if it's possible, could you uh, sum up what Pound did in his editing that was so uh, transformational, if it was? I'm not the right person to ask. Uh, I'm, uh, Lindell's yeah, I, right I, I here. About Lindell's say, right here. We have people far more qualified yeah. than I to answer that question. We do have Linda in the front row. He did. I mean, the poem is, the Wasteland is dedicated to Pound, whom Eliot calls Il Miglior Fabro, uh, the greatest blacksmith. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, the little I know is that he had a, a very big hand in editing and taking things out. Um, I don't no, and I know Pound has become a very controversial figure. Yeah. So. He, apparently he removed 220 lines from the wasteland, and Elliot sort of built all of the story bits, and yeah. then Pound said, let's take all the story bits that help people through, and let's right. talk about the fragments, which was what right, you were saying, right, the fragments. looking into the scenes. The other thing that's interesting um, is that um, Valerie also helped. Ali's wife also helped to edit mm. The Wasteland. So it wasn't just Pound. Mm. And I feel like I would be remiss not to say that with Lyndall Gordon, who writes about women as well <laughs> in the front row. So any other questions? I think you can find... Um, Kamal, can you wait for the microphone, please? Oh, did we have uh, one in yeah. the back, though? Sorry. One in the one, back, we and then we'll take Kamal in the front. Thank you. Um, so uh, spectacular. Uh, extremely, extremely musical performance. Um, and um, I'm just kind of wondering, when you get into the headspace, of like trying to perform this and working on it and framing it and voicing it. Is there any music that you help, that, that sort of guides you, that gets you there? No, no specific. Uh, if there's a musicality, I try to find it in the words and let right. the words sort of carry me. I, it, it may sound sort of trite, but I really do try to just let it pass through me in a sense of being, you know. Uh, there, there were a lot of attempts by 
20th century composers to uh, oh, yeah. adapt the wasteland and they all kind of failed. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, and I think that's because it's, it's just kind of musical in and of itself and it yeah. shouldn't be adapted. So thank you. But like, thank I, you. I, thank you. Thank you. Mina. And then we had up front. We have a question in the front. I'm sorry. It wasn't really a question. I think you can find, um, pounds L uh, editing of Elliot's manuscript online. It's all scanned in the documents well, and it, yeah. it's quite extreme and, and just looking at it and reading it, it's really accessible, but I believe that the Faber Centenary Edition in print has exactly what you're talking about. Hmm. Has uh, it's sort of side by side, the original and then what ended up on the page. Wonderful. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Eduardo, thank you again for oh, coming and joining us and reading for us today. It was an absolute sensation. Thank you, thank you so much. It. Ladies and gentlemen, thank Eduardo. Thank you. And as always, I will remind you that there are copies of The Wasteland for sale uh, in the bookshop, Buxton Books. There are copies for sale. Um, if you don't want to buy your mother or your auntie or your cousin a copy of The Wasteland, T.S. Eliot also wrote a book of poems about cats. <laughs> the sociology and the psychology of the feline. So maybe that's a better Christmas present. Thank you, everybody.